तलवार Well, uh, many times uh, people confuse uh, my hospital with the Rajiv Gandhi Super Specialty Hospital, which is in Timarpur. So okay. ours is the Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Institute, which is in Roini. So as RGCI. far as we are concerned, yeah, RGCI. We are a niche cancer center, and uh, unlike the other general hospitals, we are taking care of only cancer patients. And of course, nowadays uh, we are doing active screening for the COVID patients also. So, so how the situation? See, uh, situation is that we come across uh, patients who turn out to be COVID positive. So, depending upon the risk stratification, we send them to with the COVID centers, and once they get better, then we continue the treatment. And as all of us know that patients who have cancer, they have uh, uh, high propensity to develop uh, severe. Uh, signs and symptoms of covid so that keeping in mind you know we are very aggressive in uh, screening these patients so any patient who's for elective surgery we are doing the uh, covid 19 uh, testing any patient who's going for procedures uh, like biopsies or endoscopies or bronchoscopies where you know the uh, there can be a aerosol generation Yeah. and can be harmful for the person who's doing the procedure all these areas are the ones where we take extra precautions most of the patients nowadays so called patients are coming uh, asymptomatic in fact if you go by the statistics about 60% of the patients are asymptomatic so one has to be really wary uh, whenever uh, you know we are uh, seeing the patients in the opd or otherwise whether they undergo chemotherapy or uh, surgery and sir also uh, yeah, what the cancer patient uh, should know at this point of time uh, during covid i mean what are the uh, things they need to know uh, and to protect themselves uh, because they must be coming for chemotherapy and for other treatments is on day to day basis maybe alternate days so what are the uh, precautions or measures or what are the information they need to know at this point of time see the there is there are no specific uh, you know signs and symptoms which they have to look for because they are going to be the same in a covid patient or if it's a cancer patient with covid okay the other thing is that in cancer patients uh, specifically they have to maintain uh, good hygiene point number 1 second they have to have good hydration you know especially when the temperatures are now soaring they should have uh, adequate uh, intake of water preferably about 1.5 to 2 liters per day and third of course is good nutrition because you treat a cancer patient who has a poor nutrition this of is you treat a patient uh, who is in uh, good nutrition definitely the person who is with the good nutrition will uh, fare much better apart from that you know you have plethora of uh, small small uh, studies in which uh, some people have said that uh, vitamin c is much better some people have said that uh, addition of selenium and uh, zinc in the diet is much better for cancer patients or flavoprenols and some people have said that vitamin d if the intake is there you know that keeps uh, covid at bay but uh, all those you know if the randomized trials are not there one should take them with a pinch of salt suffice to say these three uh, dictums one has to follow if uh, one is a cancer patient and definitely whenever there is a even a small fever say 99 or 100 even a single spike yeah. as compared to a normal individual who is immuno competent cancer patients you know they should immediately report to their uh, centers where they are getting treatment and we should take stock whether it is you know a uh, normal uh, flu like infection in, or any bacterial infection or you know it is a covid infection which is uh, brewing up in the patients so can i ask you a question sir yeah a uh, general question to vinit sir yes. so uh, basically you deal with lot of cancer patients they are all immunocompromised because of chemotherapy or stuff like that right 
so what happens is like you know we depend upon uh, nasal swabs for diagnosis as pulmonologist and hrct chest picture which shows a viral pneumonia sort of picture right because most of our patients are immunocompetent but the similar picture can be even seen in immunocompromised host which you guys deal with so how is that you come to a diagnosis that this is, could be covid and this could not be covid so because the nasal swabs are only positive 66 percent of times that is 34 people will be still be diagnosed as negative in spite of they being positive so is there an algorithm which you have made or a scoring system which you have made by which you come to a diagnosis or how do you do it sir the challenging thing sir see uh, your question is very valid because you have a patient who already has a compromised lung and on top of that you have a malignancy so how you go about it and on top of that you know what we say in hindi sone pe swaga you have covid so how do you go about assessing these people well uh, first is you know you we take a detailed history right sir. and we take a history in which uh, if the patient has had uh, any contacts with uh, any patients who are you know covid patients or patient is in a hot spot or the patient has had a fever mm-hmm. in the recent past these things are there if uh, any one of them is there then what we do is we do the pulse oximetry because mm-hmm. uh, in the initial phase all the covid patients they have a oxygen desaturation which yeah, absolutely in 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 many times maybe asymptomatic only but then sure. you know once the uh, the storm storm comes then they rapidly deteriorate right. so we check the temperature we see uh, the physical condition of the patient we do the oxygen uh, saturation by pulse oximetry we do the chest x ray yes. and after that you know when we get this basic data we have a uh, infectious diseases physician who's uh, specifically dedicated for all the infectious diseases we bring that person into the loop and if still we have doubt as you said that we bring in our uh, pulmonary team but then in almost 80% of times you know with this kind of infrastructure and sops we are able to you know shift out we are able to segregate which patients may be you know uh, possible uh, covid patients and which patients won't be and then after that even after that we don't leave them alone we have uh, isolation wards we immediately shift these patients from the triage to the isolation wards we don't take them to the normal wards because they are the clean areas and in isolation wards immediately we send the covid test after sending the covid test after say about 24 to 36 hours if the test comes negative and mm. the patient is clinically improving and mm. the patient does not have any desaturation or uh, symptoms of fever or respiratory deterioration we shift them out of the isolation wards but if we still have any doubt we keep them there and after say about 4 or 5 days again we repeat the test mm. just to be doubly sure even if they are negative two times negative then of course you know there's a limit to which you can keep on testing uh, mm. for covid then that is the time you know we shift the patient out and we treat them like <coughs> regular uh, cancer patients so there has been a study or which shows that the salivary samples are more are specific better. Uh, better. better yes better yes, yes, yes. do you yeah. want to implement that in your cancer patient because in cancer patient to get a sample is a bit difficult job right get well, your uh, see uh, there are you know lot of problems lot of practical problems when you go about taking samples you have to make sure that your technical staff or the technicians who take the sample they are also well versed with taking saliva samples how right. much to take when to take you know whether the patient should be fasting or not mm-hmm. most of the technicians who take the samples they are quite well versed with the throat swab mm. so so that comes as a practical challenge but yes studies are now showing that saliva is definitely better right and of course it is uh, easier also but then there is a learning curve you have to teach your staff that right. you know at this point of time becomes a challenge when you are you know doing fire fighting right so can i ask you another question being an oncological unit there was a study from china wuhan which showed the concentration of viruses in the hospital area right they found the maximum concentration of virus on the mouse of the icu led to a lesser degree on the floor of the icu 
but the pharmacy had the 100% shops is performing positive. Is there a way where you can deploy UVC lamps? Because so you, are, you deal closely with radiation, radiation technology, so I'm asking you. Is there a way where you can deploy UVC lamps, far light lamps at 222 nanometers to achieve the environmental sterilization? Because what I feel in my personal experience is hospitals are becoming secondary nidus for community outbreaks yeah. of COVID. So that is again a very interesting question. What we are doing is, you know, you have to think everything in totality. You can't just go yeah. by the book. So, you know, do in Rome as Romans do, do in India as Indians do. So what we are doing is we are uh, spraying hypochlorite. You know, mm -hmm. you have to identify areas which are at a maximum risk. And studies have shown that, you know, the walking tunnels, you know, the, yes. the areas, yes. the, the walkaways, which are narrow, they are the ones which harbor the maximum uh, virus. Mm -hmm. So the pathways, you know, which are narrower than, say, about eight feet, and yeah. people are going through that, we are spraying that with hypochlorite solution every two hourly. Every two hourly, irrespective. Wow. So we have identified those walkways where the patient movement is maximum. And it has been seen, you know, the patient movement is maximum in OPD areas. And wherever you have alleys and corridors which are narrow, they are given maximum, uh, you know, uh, thought. And, of course, the areas where OPDs are there, testing areas are there, labs are there. There also we keep on spraying hypochlorite. And there are dedicated ward boys which keep on scrubbing the, you know, the most common handrails, grab rails after every four to five hours. Even in our OPDs, I make sure that there is a chap with a mop who keeps on mopping almost yep. because by the time he finishes from one end of the OPD to the other side, it is almost one or two hours. Oh. And then again, we have told him that after every four hours, you have to mop again. So the, another chap starts from the other side. So, you know, do in India as Indians do, that is what we are trying to do. Because UV, of course, that is a good thought. But then practical feasibility is a big problem. So spraying, you know, hypochlorite is not that costly. It's about uh, seven, eight hundred uh, to a liter and you have to make it in a dilution. So that is the cheapest way to go about. Yeah. Here I, I would like to add on that yes. what we are doing we are mopping the table, sofa, and the patient bed after each and every patient in OPD. After each and every patient, we are just, mm -hmm. there is a, uh, one guy who is doing the same. Uh, this is only, he's only for the moping and he's paying the hypochlorite and moping with the hypochlorite. The patient, mm -hmm. uh, patient bed, patient sofa, and the doctor's table. Right. So we are doing that. But apart from that, we are mopping the floors also. And yes, the, yeah, that, the, is, that is two exam, hourly. Floors are two hourly. Yeah. And the examination couch, which is there, we are not using these standard sheets. In our daycare wards, we are using those, you know, uh, disposable paper, sheet. paper, like, paper sheets. Yeah, yeah. even they, we are also using you know, paper sheets. Yeah. They come very economical, you know. You get it in bulk, you get a good quotation. Yes. So, you know, you have to improvise uh, whichever <laughs> way. You can't go by yeah. what the Western literature says. Yeah, right. India is India is 1.3 billion, and even if you talk of metros, you're talking of 10 percent of the whole. So 10 percent right. of one 1.3 billion is equivalent to you know six seven European countries. Yeah, right. So you can't uh, extrapolate that to the Indian scenario. So uh, agreed uh, totally to you, sir, uh, on the methods of it. But a UVC lamp, this what uh, like you know a thought came to my mind. If you deploy them in areas of high concentration, far light UVC lamps, it is uh, you you get rid of the person who is going to mop your floor, because the person who is going to mop your floor is going to become more infected infected one point or the other time of there. You cannot have you hundred percent protection rate every time. You have to save that person's life. A lamp okay, you just have to install a bulb and just leave it at that. It is. So because I thought of this idea because if we don't think tangentially and we don't think out of the box other tradition uh, the rate at which covid is growing right now in our country is on a, a, a log phase sir. it's an upright curve still we have yet to reach the peak and rainy season is approaching sir so how effective will our methods be of mopping and everything in the rings because they all will go for a toss sir in a larger scale. i think so i think we have to we have to change our thinking thought right. process 
and first thing which should come into the mind is that every patient which is coming to you in the opd is a suspect mm-hmm. covid patient covid patient right sir until another you know take another wise yes because most of these patients are asymptomatic so if right. you have that thought process in mind automatically yes, your sir. sops will go accordingly yes sir then of course you know as a policy decision you can uh, say whether you want to use hypochlorite you want to use uh, ultraviolet whether you want to use disinfectants or you want to use any other kind of uh, you know antiviral or germicide uh, dull drug that is up to you but yes. till the time you don't change your mindset nothing is going to happen right and i think that we we need to follow this mindset uh, for long period of time because covid will right. stay hit, uh, and if uh, if we have a vaccine maybe in next 6 months 6 to 8 months still we have to follow these precautions uh, which is self distancing uh, physical distancing and uh, following the washing hands and using sanitizers and uh, maybe wearing a mask mask could be a necessary uh, so i think we have to follow all these things but uh, as all doctors uh, are on uh, panel right now you are uh, the front runners and uh, so uh, all our viewers would like to know that uh, they are wearing n95 mask and they are wearing different mask mm. so how important is to change your mask and how important is to protect your mask so that you can use it uh, i mean maybe four five times not more than that because people are tend to use the same mask again and again they are not following the pattern of changing the mask uh ankit if to answer your question of n95 mask each mask has a shelf life recommended by the manufacturer n95 mask without a valve has a shelf life of 4 to 6 hours and with the valve the shelf life increases to 12 hours now it is very difficult to spend 4 or 500 rupees every day yeah. to get a new mask right which is difficult for us i will tell you what my friends in the us do that they have a lot of bulk patients coming in they wear an n95 mask about that they wear a surgical mask and about that they wear a paper mask okay, okay? what is change is the paper mask and they have five masks kept in a row and each mask one day is sent for uv sterilization and one mask is used after every five days this is the way they have rotated the masks successfully well and since the time of pandemic which has happened in us till date none of them have got infected with covid which tells me that their mask rotation policy somewhat we have to adopt to ourselves you know we have to rotate our masks we don't have to keep wearing the same mask again and again but after a particular period of time we can reuse the mask after it left to uh, some treatment or uh, uv light ethylene oxide treatment or we just left to dry the sun because the virus dies at different rates on different surfaces which has put you in the first thing i think i would uh, agree with uh, dr rahul as he saying we are also following the same policy five masks you know and uh, i personally what i do is the time i take it out i leave it out in the sun right auto auto sanitation yeah yes. then you know depending upon the days i keep on using it i use it four times and fifth time i discard it Right. After four or five times, uh, it is not advisable to use it. So, if you have five masks, generally about uh, say three weeks, you can use it. And again, it depends that you know you don't necessarily have to wear a N95 mask everywhere. If you are uh, in a COVID hospital, yes, hundred percent. If you are right. in a non-COVID hospital, and if you are in a low risk area, low risk area, I mean, I mean, if you are in the OPD. or you are just in the lab then you know a three ply surgical mask can suffice but that is disposable you cannot use it again you have to throw it off and uh, the moment you find that your mask is getting wet with the humidity or something yes or you know there are some dirt or something then immediately you have to discard it you cannot use it n95 or the otherwise and if you are in a high risk area say opds where the patient interaction is there then you make sure you know the distance is about 1 and 1/2 to 2 meters initially we used to yeah. say 1 meter but now yeah. it is about 2 meters. meters although there are studies you know which show that uh, the aerosol can travel about uh, 20 oh. to 24 feet so oh. yeah. yeah there are studies but then the general idea is 2 meters so 2 meters distancing you can wear a 3 ply mask you can discard it or you wear a n95 you have the 5 mask as dr rahul said and then you keep on rotating it and uh, <clears throat> of course the interaction time should not be more than 4 to 5 minutes yes. and if possible don't examine if you think there is a great need then you have a partial ppe you know a disposable gown and you have a n95 mask and a visor 
examine the patient and you have to you know there should be a duffing and doffing you have to throw that all the mask and the ppe and again change the you know the cap and the mask to see the next patient and between yes. each and every patient it is always better if you have soap and water yes it is always preferable to the hand rub right because hand rub it has its own uh, you know uh, uh, utility well time yes. yes and to add to what sir said like you know it is very good to uh, what sir said to use a soap and water because soap and yes. water is the most effective thing time limit is 30 seconds again i stress on it because there's a data which shows using soap and water for 30 seconds of a hand rub minimizes the risk of transmission right that's a very good thing which we have can practice and you can follow there so sir very well said and you then you have a bunch of masks i found yeah. it on master please cut one mask from a random bunch and see what is there inside it i found a tissue paper it's of n95 layer in one of the masks oh my so, And that so was that, a Indian mask oh, or a imported mask? A tissue. Uh, sir, uh, sir. Uh, now to be honest to you, imported masks uh, we don't have, uh, have much access to. They're very expensive. We always use the uh, local made masks available to us, whatever the institute gives us. But we do have a policy that whatever the mask will pick, pick it up at random, cut it, open it, and check it for us what is there inside it. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm, yeah, my apologies for being so late. I just got back from my first doctor's appointment in two months. Um, they uh, figured out I needed my treatments, and so they worked me in. It was quite a journey, um, an experience too, because um, I, I just want to share it with you on how things have changed. But um, from the moment I arrive in my car, my vehicle, I stay parked outside. They come out to me, and they interview me. They're all masks, PPE, and everything. And then I follow them in, and I wash my hands at the door, or that one layer of the door. They have two layers, yeah. and so I, I do my hands and get a mask. And like Dr. Sagu taught us how to wear it, they want me yeah. to wear blue out, so yeah. I put it on. And wash my hands again, and then we go to another door, and then I do my um, my regular check in where they weigh me and um, band. They put my bands on and and stuff like that. But it's very hard because it's hard to speak through th this, right? And you could tell they're having a hard time communicating with us. But they 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 do this very well because they're experienced. So. Um, But everything, every time we touch something, they tell us to wash, to, to gel our hands. But every time we touch something, if we touch a door, wash your hands. If we um, go into a room and they put the meters on our oxygen meters on our fingers and, and, and everything, because they do our vitals, wash your hands. It was interesting to do my temperature because they still do it under the tongue with a mask. So I, I was expecting a scanner, but they still use um, the the regular thermometer. Um, but uh, after all of that, my treatments my, went normal. So you know, I we we did everything went normal, except when when, when I was done, um, they could not like do any prescriptions. They're, they're, this was just flow in and out. And I exited out of a, a door I never even knew existed. I've been in and out of that building for years. And I thought I knew every door until today. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. And they go, oh, no, we, we can't have risk of any patients bumping into each other at all. So I found out that there's another back door. And it, uh, and it exit out to actually my favorite place, which is a they have a big, beautiful a uh, water pond and picnic area back there. So, um, but I've never gone that way before. So anyway, that was my experience, a new experience with the doctors. They asked me how I learned to do my, wash my hands properly. <laughs> <laughs> They go, Kim, you've become an expert. <laughs> and I go, watch my show, watch our show. We have Dr. Sugu and, and everyone. So they taught us how to, yeah. 
Dr. Sugu taught us how to do that and wear the mask. So, um, yeah. so I, I was considered an expert today <laughs> and I was happy. So, and I'm happy because I got my treatments. I feel better. So, um, it, <coughs> It, it so, was uh, so Kim, we, we, we were discussing the same thing with the uh, with Dr. Vipin and Dr. Pulmonologist uh, uh, Dr. Rahul from Mumbai and from Delhi. So the same thing we were discussing the uh, I mean how our OPD has changed now, what the policies and SOPs we have changed regarding our OPDs, IPDs, and OTs also. So I think the same screening program is also running in our hospitals in our clinics also here. The same thing we are receiving the patients from outside. And we are screening the patients there. And inside the OPD also, we are doing uh, disinfecting all the surfaces each, after each and every patient. Yeah, we are asking the patient to wash the hands. And even we are also washing our hands after each and every patient. So yeah. the same, uh, yeah. No, it's and, 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 I, and I, I, it's interesting because I, I didn't know what to expect. I have not been to any of my physicians at all um, since and actually the doctors inside the building they don't know what's going on out there I have a very good uh, rapport with my doctor um, and physician she's been treating me for many many years and my disease is so rare she's really always taken particular interest in and then so I was, she she asked me what is it like out there and I told her and she goes I had no idea they're meeting you at the car she goes oh my god <laughs> so and interesting enough, and I, I don't know if it's like this um, in your country, but uh, we have a really bad problem with uh, drug dealers and drug people. And this is uh, considered a pain clinic, even though um, mm -hmm. I get treated for other things, neurological problems. Um, mm -hmm. They have a armed guard in the lobby at all times because they have drug dealers come in with guns and try to steal the medication from the clinics. Um, so, kind of, and he's still there, but he's got a mask on now. So, yeah, yeah. so that but, is why now this is the global village. You know, we are speaking the same language, each and every uh, person from the every part of the globe. We are speaking yeah. the same thing. We are following the same policy. We are doing the same thing. I think this is the first time in all of the world. This Corona has, you know, uh, brought us in the global village. The global village, you know, we're, we're one now. And this is something I think I was texting a question while I was driving and listening. I, I wasn't driving and texting. I stopped at a red light. But um, my journey is an hour. So that's why it took me so long. But um, anyway, I, I wanted to know what can we do globally to connect um, because it seems like, you know, everybody's doing these common practices. I'm sure the who is sharing information. I don't, I don't feel like they shared it very well or CBC shared it very well in the beginning, but maybe somehow we can connect data and information uh, globally uh, so that we can continue uh, to, to operate without ever having to close down again when this happens, because this will happen again. This, this, uh, another virus will uh, attack us again. Is, is that your thoughts, Dr. Sugu? Yeah, at, at least, at least we should be ready to fight against any type of the outbreak. At least we should stand on our healthcare. What was lacking behind us as we were, we were not investing on the healthcare. 